I have two guests with me today. I have Dan Austin here, who's a guitarist and a machinist, a guitar builder. He does so many things. He built a lot of this studio here. He's an amazing guy, and uh, we're very happy to have him here today. So welcome, Dan, the man. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Man of few words. Doesn't talk, yeah. but he does a lot. Also, my right-hand guy, Dirk Kloiber, here in the studio. He is responsible for everything that works in the studio. We've been friends and colleagues and brothers since 2005, right? That is correct. That's yes. when I ruined your life. Well, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that is right. And uh, Dirk's also a guitar player. And we're here, and Jeff Laffler's also in the studio today. And we're here today to answer a question, if we can, uh, from somebody that wrote in and asked, are factory guitars junk? And that is the subject today. Um, everybody knows I'm building a new bass. And when I say factory guitars, I mean guitars, basses, uh, or anything that you know contemporary players would want to buy. And I'm relating it more to guitars and basses because that's uh, the instrument I play. So anyway, first up, Dan, you're a guitarist. You've been a guitarist mm -hmm. all your life, right? Yes, it's 12. Yeah. Are factory guitars junk? So personally, I don't believe they're junk. I think junk's a pretty strong word. Uh, I believe that guitars that are fabricated and manufactured today in the factories, the way they've automated their processes and all their equipment, they're built very consistent. They're built, they're built as accurately as possible. They have good quality control. Um, I think there's some truth to you kind of get what you pay for. Um, the, Wood may be beautiful, the finish may be beautiful because they have all these modern uh, techniques now. Um, I think a lot of the uh, pricing structure in manufactured instruments is in the hardware and the electronics. That doesn't mean if you buy a 10,000 or 30,000 or 50,000 guitar, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be great, right? No, not at all. Um, I believe that you know everybody has their own techniques and their own uh, styles of playing so you still need to pick an instrument that fits your style and uh you know that you're comfortable with playing so that you will enjoy playing it and you'll want to keep improving in that instrument dirk so you've recorded you know some of the biggest guitar players in the world they've come through this studio i mean you know joe stump and mike badio and we, you know we could go on forever there's been a lot of guys over the years yes and you also play guitar i mean are factory guitars junk well, I, I would have to agree with um, Dan that, that they're not really junk, but um, that you also get what you pay for. But I think what the problem is, pretty much anything in the world that's not one size fits all. Uh, that's why if you take it seriously, first of all, if you can you know, go to multiple music stores, check out the guitar you want to buy, you play them. If they feel good, they feel good. But then if you really want to get uh, um, uh, into the professional level, or if you like a really avid amateur, um, you're gonna customize your guitar. You're gonna you're gonna really make it your own, and that's where it gets really going down a rabbit hole. Uh, depending what you want to do and how far you want to go, um, it, it it starts with the action. It starts with the frets. It it goes on to the tone controls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. You know the finish. Maybe you want to change the finish. You know then you you know build one yourself maybe. But in general, there is junk out there, but I don't think a generalization that factory guitars are junk is the correct expression. Yeah. My personal experience, when I first started out, I was 10 years old, my parents bought me a guitar. It was a Kent single pickup guitar. And, you know, I don't know if Arnold Schwarzenegger could have pushed down those strings. The action was like this high off the fingerboard. And for me, it was a drag. I didn't feel good. I just had no idea what a luthier was. Nobody talked about action back then or was able to help me out. I mean, the people I talked to, the guys at the music store hanging around, they had their own ideas, but they were completely full of shit. I mean, if they were doing anything, they wouldn't have been hanging around the music store. It was hard for me to get good information. And I think the thing today that I want people to hear is from experienced people that it is about personalization and less about how much money you spend because i've seen i've seen some really quote unquote inexpensive guitars made today that 
were made pretty good, I have yeah. to say. Mm -hmm. And some were junk, in my opinion. And I think that's the whole selection process that maybe when a boatload of guitars comes in from somewhere into the States, there's no guarantee that those guitars are all going to have the same consistency and the same quality. I, I just don't see that, that that is possible. I agree with you on the machining part today. Things are CNC'd, but still, we have to be mindful of things like moisture mm. you know uh, and mm -hmm. humidity non-humidity um heat and string variants i mean there, there's just so much that goes into mm. it yeah i believe that the finishes on the guitars are gorgeous and the a lot of brand new guitars that you'll see on a rack in a large box store uh those guitars are aimed at more of the beginner uh, musicians because they're you know flashy uh, older people like us that are out buying guitars, we're probably not going to buy a brand new guitar. Mm. We're going to buy a used guitar that mm. we know is aged, and we're going to modify it to our mm. our use anyway. So uh, I believe that uh, guitar manufacturers do like to yeah get very flashy and and sell with all these gimmicks. It just doesn't mean that they have the best components in them. That's and the best hardware. Yeah. Well, you know. To my liking, I I have to say, if I were starting out today, I would definitely go and try and play as many guitars as I possibly mm -hmm. could. Mm -hmm. I know there's people out there selling guitars and basses that are signature models, and I think that's great. And I know that uh, somebody like Michael Badio, okay, he plays a signature model guitar. Mm -hmm. That is something that he feels good playing, and it is geared toward him physically and his hands. I don't think that means that everybody that goes out there and buys one of those guitars is going to be as happy. So the right. answer is you have to try it. Right. You know, uh, you've got somebody like Billy Sheehan selling these Yamaha basses, which seem like really fine instruments. He apparently says he could play them right off the rack, and I believe him. I think he's you know an honest guy and a good player. But again, those guitars are geared for his hands, his fingers, and what he likes in the neck and the neck size. And there may be millions of people out there that have that same physical characteristic and want that sound and want that style. And so those probably end up being very good instruments. I personally fall into a category all my own only because of my fanaticism and, and sickness about wanting to have something that I hear in my head that I have not been able to achieve yet um, in, in more than 40 years. And that drives me into my own um, niche, so to say. And I, I hope that's why we have the followers that we have with Man of War, because musically speaking, we like to believe that we are in our own category and we have our own sound. And that sound was forged over trial and error for, for many years. And, and both of you guys and Jeff as well, you're all part of your own suffering, suffering with me, trying to get to, to where I can play and hear what I hear in my head. And it's this eternal quest, but I'm having fun doing it. I know I'm yeah. ruining your lives on occasion in the studio and, and also you know, in the studio and live uh, with you guys. But it, it's a worthy quest if you're looking for something and you hear it and you're an individual and you just know that you've got a feeling for playing and, and you're on a quest. The taste for sound or what, what you like at the moment, it's not like a static thing. You know, it's evolving over time. So, you know, it's not like it, you that, that you, for every album or for every live show, you're going to have the same sound all the time because... You're looking for something, and that's why it changes all the time, too, I think, because you're looking for something at that moment in time. It doesn't mean, you know, you don't want to replicate the sound that you had, like, 30 years ago, and, and you probably can't because it was different electronics, different different instrument, it's, you know, everything. You, you played maybe differently, you know, you everybody evolves. The, the, you know, the, the technical side evolves, and you yourself evolve as a human being, so I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a crazy quest. I, th I just think things evolve, and you just want to be finding that tone, that sound that you hear at every stage of your life, you know, and at every moment of your life. And on that, no, it's not only the sound that evolves. I've been with Joey for 12 years and his technique has changed a lot yes, in 12 correct, years. So correct. we have changed a lot of the string gauges, uh, the way we set up action, the way we set up the basses mm -hmm. is, is quite a bit different now. Mm -hmm. than, and that changes all the time. Plus we're always looking for the next trick. So yeah. 
and we experiment a lot. Yep. And it's funny that you, you mentioned that because for all the people out there that have asked me, well, what strings are you using? Uh, what's your string spacing? What is everything? You know, I'm not trying to hide anything that I'm doing. In fact, everything I'm doing, I think, is really, really basic. But the truth is, it's changing every day. I mean, every tour, things change. The the only thing that really hasn't changed much is my live touring rig because that's been purpose built. And even though there's been small refinements over the years, I'm playing through like 20,000 watts of power. And so the preamps and things that I'm using wouldn't apply to somebody else. My equipment is sculpted for dealing with massive amounts of volume and power and being able to reproduce a dynamic range that live in an arena or outside might not be the same thing you'd want in a more controlled environment like a club or a theater. And, and mm. that's another key point that I want everybody to know. You're going to have to get on your own path of not being afraid to hack up a guitar or a bass. I mean, it, there, I don't know any other way to do it, is just take something apart and just constantly try different things. Mm. When you hear the question, you are, are um, factory guitars junk. I think it also stems from the fact that a lot of people who start out playing guitar and want to pick up the first guitar, they are attracted to those factory guitars, those signature guitars, you know, because they have like, an, you know, their favorite guitarist, their favorite bassist, oh, they have like a signature guitar. And they want to sound like them, and they think they sound like them when they buy these guitars. And, and, and I think a big advice would be, you know, you will never sound like your idol, you know, it, it's just a fact, because you don't have their brain and you don't have their hands. Plus, then it goes into uh, the instrument itself. I don't believe that any factory guitar is really exactly the same as you, as that person whose signature guitar is um, what he would play live or she would play live. I, I don't believe that, yeah. even if they say that, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't think you can just go into a music store, pick up that signature guitar, and it's exactly like XYZ plays it. You know, yeah, it may be very yeah. close, but close exact, maybe, but I, not I exactly. So. I don't and think and so. what he what he's talking about is, you know, let's just take the wood of the guitar. Okay, maybe it is the very very same wood, but wood is not wood. You know, maple from one tree is not maple from another tree. That's that's the first thing. The other thing is that wood has strings hooked to it, and God knows what strings anybody's using. And believe me, it makes a big difference the kind of strings you use. Also, those strings are hooked to machine heads. The machine heads, if it's cheap pot metal, it's not going to vibrate the way you know titanium is going to. And then, of course, the strings are hooked to the nut. And believe me, I have experimented with every type of nut you could ever imagine. And I know people think, well, that's what's the big deal. It is a big deal. Trust me, it makes a difference whether you're using brass, stainless steel, bone, um, plastic. I, I could go on forever and all the way down to the bridges. And then we haven't even gotten into the pickups yet. So it's an endless, endless journey toward mixing and matching these components. And every combination of, of different components, I think you both agree, yeah. everything makes a difference. Yeah. And it's like a puzzle. You change one thing, it affects everything else. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. That's why we have like 10,000 pickups right now outside laying around, yes. which are being tested. <laughs> and no right? two and, uh, are wound the same. Yeah. No. Also positioning, you know, how they're mm -hmm. being positioned, what type of pickup, uh, you know, ohm rating, and et cetera, et cetera. You know? Well, I can say that it's probably time to show a picture of, of what we're talking about. So in the continuing quest to try and find what's the next thing in my evolution as a player, uh, particularly with having an alien like Michael Badio uh, in the group. <laughs> and the reason why I say he's an alien is because in addition to his personality being one of the nicest, most pleasant, professional people in the world, and this is not a commercial for the guy, but the guy is genuinely a nice person. He's intelligent, he's polite, he's professional. He really cares about you know the fans and he respects them. He cares about his students and so forth. But in terms of being a player, everybody knows that he's fast. Okay, sure, he can certainly play fast, no doubt about it. And believe me, it takes balls to stand on stage with that guy and play with him. And it's an extreme uh, inspiration and a lot of fun. But beyond that, his technique is really, really amazing. And to think that his action is like that far off the neck, and of course I'm exaggerating, but it might as well be because it's so high. I mean, I've picked up his guitar and it is 
amazingly difficult to play. But for him, he said he started out that way and it, and it works for him. With me, I am just the opposite. I would like it so that you would have to measure the difference with some kind of nuclear microscope to, to get my strings close enough. I, I just prefer, you know, really, really close action. And I have some good guitars that have been built for me. And we've even hacked those up. And they were not cheap instruments, but trying to refine them uh, has, has led us to that point. And so now Dan came up with the idea that, well, in order to get the action that you want, we've got to have an aluminum neck. And so this first picture that you're going to see is basically it's a chunk of aluminum. Am I right? It's a solid bar of 6061 billet aluminum. And the reason I selected aluminum over some other uh, alloys and, or even woods is because with your touring schedule, and all the different atmospheres you're in in the morning, the forklifts are running equipment around and it's 55 degrees in these arenas. By showtime, it's 75 or 80 degrees. Uh, there's big swings in temperature and humidity. And one thing wood does not like is humidity. And the uh, what we found in all our uh, testing over the years is that uh, the wood does react uh, a lot to humidity and temperature. And we've had to chase truss rods and neck, necks around because your action's so low. Um, it has to be done literally before every show uh, to be the best playable instrument possible. With the aluminum, we can eliminate an issue with the humidity. So I thought, well, this is a great place to start. Um, there's other alloys, but they actually expand and contract more than aluminum does um, with temperature ranges. So that was led to my selection of the aluminum. It's not a new concept. Aluminum base necks have been made and are being made every day. Um, but we're just building aluminum base that meets Joey's criteria and uh, his technique and his dimensions. You've witnessed this in the recording studio yourself, right? If it's a yes. little too hot or too cold or too dry, you know, these bases are so sensitive that they, they do move. They do, they do, definitely. Um, um, I mean, wood is um, breathing, you know, and expanding, contracting with temperatures, humidity. And so you, you have to look out for that and, and, and you know, sometimes wait until it acclimatizes. What's what's the word? Yeah, acc acclimat <laughs> yeah. acclimatizes. Yeah. Acclimatizes. Yeah, and um, so yes, it's it's a big factor, and I think seeing that aluminum guitar is, is something really new to me as, as well. You know, I'm I'm curious how this turns out, and um, so far it looks great. You know, yeah. and um, like I said, it's 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 an interesting experiment. You know, so this next picture is a picture of my main bass. It's called the Demon, and in this picture, uh, we're seeing kind of a template. And so maybe you can explain a little bit yeah, about I that. I was uh, developing templates for the different scales of bases so that we could pick a custom scale for your base so that um, it neither be long, medium, or short scale, or one that we're making up, which um, we kind of are now. Um, I had to have a template to uh, start designing to and to lay out in a 2D drawing format um, the shapes. And then from there, I could start calculating weights, thicknesses, and um, uh, all the offset dimensions I was going to need so that it would be a playable instrument. Well, this next picture, actually, we're going to show, it goes into what you were talking about, about the actual CAD design. And I think it's a picture of the neck and uh, the truss rod system that you're developing. Yeah, it's a cross-section view of the neck, of your necks. Um, these necks are not anything you can buy in a store today at those dimensions um, or those shapes. Um, what I am experimenting with is uh, where to put the truss rod, um, can I get some carbon fiber in around the truss rod? Am I going to need that? Um, then it's also the uh, fretboard materials and thicknesses so that when you uh, put the fretboard to the aluminum, you know, am I you know, going to have enough rigidity? Because the goal is to uh, little as adjustment as possible. So under string tension, um, it's real, real consistent night to night, day to day, session to session, wherever you use these bases. Yeah, and that's uh, that's an important point. You know, I think we'll have Jeff Laffler on one of these future shows, and he can uh, tell himself better than I could ever tell the story of Provinci Rock in Finland 
before I went on stage, I had you know, a humidity problem. And I started cranking on the Rickenbacker neck and cranking on it and cranking on it. And all of a sudden, pop, and I broke the truss rod. And I had to play the show like that. And it was unbelievable. <laughs> For that day, I had Michael Badio action. It was like, whoa. I think I, my biceps grew like to about two feet big at the end of that gig. I had to play with it. I just had no other choice. You know, and uh, you know these are the the crazy things, and and that kind of supports what you're talking about. You know, it, it's just you're battling the the elements when it comes to stuff mm -hmm. like this. You know, um, let's see the next picture. Uh, we're seeing the headstock is being ground, and it looks like a there's a drill. Let's let's talk about so about actually, that process. The process is a milling process, um, and it uses a. a high speed end mill similar to like a routing bit that you would use in wood but only it's they're designed to cut metals alloys aluminum and at this point we're taking that bar and we're just getting rid of all this extra material and because the headstock we went with the tip back angle headstock design um i had to start out with a one and three quarter inch thick piece of uh, aluminum to have enough material mm -hmm. for the tip and the headstock mm -hmm. and then then two thirds of that aluminum has to be machined away. So basically where we started was generating the actual headstock shape, length, and uh, angle itself. And then the rest of the base could be machined to that so that I knew I had enough material. So then this next picture shows another grinding process That's, where you've got these two things. It looks like they're shooting coffee <laughs> on it because so it's is, a brown liquid. And, and what's that all that's about? That's really a coolant for the cutter, and it's a round-nosed uh, end mill cutter. And that, uh, through the machine programming, through my CAD design and then my solid modeling, um, I have software for the machine that uh, allows me to program the path of that cutter to profile that neck shape. Uh, this next picture is looks like a, a Gibson SG base. What what is that? <laughs> it's a it's an old bolt-on neck, I believe from Sears and Roebuck in the '60s base that I found on a lawn down in Nashville in a garage sale, and uh, picked it up for twenty dollars. So I had some art to hang in my studio, and from the road I thought it might even be a Gibson. So I had to stop, of course, and run and look at it. So I've had this laying around for 20 years. And when we were building the aluminum core for the base, which is going to be aluminum from the very end of the base to the very headstock of the base, so that all the components for the base, mechanical components, are all embedded in the same solid piece of aluminum, I needed a piece of wood to insert it in so that at least I could carry it or put it on your knee to test it. So mm -hmm. I uh, sacrificial SG bass or guitar actually uh, routed out to hold the body. And this last picture shows that you're not afraid to chop up a guitar. No, no, it's, it's just <laughs> mill it out. And so aren't you. <laughs> I said, it didn't hurt it at all. And now it, now it serves a purpose. But Joey, I also think um, um, for the for the not tech savvy people who are, are watching this, maybe we should also explain why it is so important not to have an instrument or a neck uh, that moves too much as far as if you use wood and what what it affects, what the humidity affects actually um, in terms of the wood and the playing of the guitar. Maybe maybe you can indulge us in that what it really does and how it affects your playing and the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, when when wood is in a moist atmosphere, if you're close to the beach or, you know, there's a lot of humidity in the air, that wood is going to soak up the the moisture and wood swells when that happens. Yeah. It's no difference than when, you know, water happens and there's snow, all of a sudden it, it'll crack concrete. I mean, it, it, water can be devastational. And same thing when it dries out, all of a sudden the neck dries out it's a whole different thing. I mean, that's why a lot of people try to keep a little bit of lemon oil on their neck, depending on the wood. They want to try and keep it moist to, to try and battle some of the uh, the things you deal with, you know, to temperature changes and what we're dealing with in nature. And even in Mexico when we played, I couldn't believe how dry it was on stage. It was cold mm -hmm. and it was dry. And the action that I had set up in the dressing room 
was completely different when I got on stage. It was unbelievable, uh, particularly when I was playing my solo and I really wanted it to go crazy and have a great time. It was not easy, and hence the reason to find an instrument that is going to at least give me a variance of maybe you know, two or three percent if we're lucky instead of 20 or 30 percent. And that's kind of part of the quest, you know. And mm -hmm. and kind of to, to wrap this up, I, I said it before and I'm going to say it again. I don't want anybody to be afraid to hack up a guitar. Buy a $200 guitar and don't be afraid to just tear it apart and put it back together. I mean, you've seen Eddie Van Halen do it. You've seen uh, Bill Sheehan do it with his basses and chop them up until he got what he wanted. I think you guys can and gals and everybody and anybody can can do whatever you want to follow your own path. Just don't be afraid to do it. I have been doing it every day. I'm doing it to, to pretty expensive bases that I thought were perfect for me. But there's no such thing as perfection. It's a journey. And I would say, enjoy that journey. I mean, you've recorded all these top guitar players, bass players. I mean, would you say any of those people had anything in common with each other? No, no, like it's very individual. Every, every, the choice of instrument is individual, you know, and, and everybody is an individual in itself. And so you pick something that you like. And I think my mm -hmm. advice also to anybody who, who either starts out or is already like an avid player, if you're comfortable with your instrument, play that instrument, right? Um, if, 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 if you find that that instrument doesn't suit you, but in general you like it, then modify it. But you don't have to, ha I mean, it is a good thing if you want to, you know, improve, but not everything is junk, obviously. There's a lot of junk out there, but like I said, if you like it, play it. And then probably the more you play, you will find at some point, mm, it's not good enough anymore, and then you go mm -hmm. to the next step, you know, and then you can modify it or find another instrument and go from there. Yeah. You know? And, you know, you've played all kinds of music all your life, mm -hmm. whether it's Stevie Ray Vaughan, Leonard Skinner, hit songs, rock songs, and you made a study of all these top guitarists and, and musicians. And, you know, have you seen a similarity uh, in well, these guys? Well, they used to yell at me, why is your thumb not behind the neck? Well, look at Jimmy Page, his thumb's over the top. Look at Jimi Hendrix. So the style, right, how everyone plays, the yeah, gauges yeah. of their strings. Yeah, we, we talked about this recently. You yeah. know, like, it's like, you know, there is no right and wrong. You know, right. Eddie Van Halen held his hand like this away from, from right. the body of the guitar. I mean, that, that's crazy for me to play like that, you know, not resting your hand, uh, your wrist on, on, on the body. But everybody has their different styles and there is no right and wrong. I mean, you know, if, if, if it sounds good, it mm -hmm. is good. Yeah. Yeah. And so to kind of bring this thing to a close, and I know there's been a lot of information here, and I hope you'll play the video a couple mm -hmm. different times because uh, you might have to, to to absorb some of it. But you know, we've had a great time today doing this, and I want everybody to understand, it doesn't matter whether it's a $20 guitar or, you know, a $200,000 guitar. At the end of it, you're going to have to personalize this instrument or bass or whatever you play. If you're a singer, it doesn't matter. On your way to finding what represents your voice, which could be your singing voice or your musical voice you hear inside about playing an instrument, you're going to have to experiment and you're going to have to find what you hear in your head and don't be afraid to do it and if you hack up a twenty thousand dollar guitar big deal as long as it takes you where you want to go so again to sum it up our factory guitars junk no they are not necessarily junk but you're still going to have to personalize it so that it's your thing. And I mean guitar, I mean bass, or anything you're going to buy, anything you're going to do. It could be a tennis racket. You will still have to personalize what works for you. Thank you, uh, Dan, for being here today. You're welcome. Greatly appreciated. Great Dirk, thanks for joining in the fun. Thank you for having Jeff, me. Jeff, thanks for running things behind the scene. And thank you to everybody that's been paying attention to the channel and writing in. I've, I've seen some great comments, some great suggestions. I'd love to be able to get to all of them. You're going to have to be patient. We'll try and do it, but we're doing it for all of you. So please subscribe. Tell all your friends. We're trying to build an ass-kicking community of people where we can all learn from each other and have fun doing it. So until next time, this is Joey DeMaio, Dan Austin, and Dirk saying thank you for coming by.